Well, I want to welcome everyone to the uh, November 7th meeting of the Mono Basin Historical Society. And uh, hopefully everyone is where they're uh, warm and out of the wind and uh, maybe out of the snow. Um, we switched this meeting to Zoom only because of the, uh, the weather. And I sure pray that everybody got the message. So um, we don't have a lot to report this month. Uh, the museum was all winterized. Um, of course, the out outdoor exhibits are still there for people to enjoy all throughout the, uh, throughout the year. And it always amazes me how when I drive by, even when it's, there's a lot of snow on the ground, how many people are stopped and taking pictures and walking through the outdoor exhibits. And uh, one of our neighbors even told us that uh, many of the outdoor exhibits are in their family Christmas cards through the years. Thought that was just sort of fun. And um, we're gonna look at uh, when to decorate the upside down house. And I'll send out an email and put it on Facebook once, uh, once we have a date that works out for some folks that are usually there every year. We've got a trustee meeting scheduled for tomorrow and so I'm sure we'll have more to report on that uh, that probably next month and um, last week we sent out our Mono County Historical Society's grant application and we asked for assistance in purchasing the materials to place under the outdoor artifacts where we either turned off or re, uh, directed uh, watering to protect them from deterioration. I'm sure many of you noticed the big patches of, um, of dead grass. And uh, the county doesn't help us at all with labor, but they do help with materials. And the maximum grant amount is $2,000. And they usually have been very generous and come very close to that for us. So we're hoping for the same thing. Um, December meeting, we don't yet have a, uh, a presentation set up and we've got a fair amount of folks out of town, but I'll send out um, what we plan to do for December uh, before too awful long so people are aware. And let's see, and then um, we've got our newsletter. Hopefully we'll get together and get it out by the end of the month. And uh, so folks could, um, can have that for the holiday season. Uh, that's about it for the announcements. And- um, Can I ask a question? You betcha. Um, or it has to do with announcements. Since you mentioned we're going to be looking at a date for decorating the, for the holidays, the upside down house. For the yes. upside down decorations. Yes. We have a lot of things that people have donated over the years, but I think it's worth it asking if anybody around here has something that they really think would be a nice addition for the uh, you know the holiday season. Something that if you mount it upside down, you can tell it's upside down. Um, for example, a, a circular wreath doesn't really work very well in the upside down house message, but uh, uh, an elf standing on its feet from the roof of the upside down house or whatever it does. So I'm just saying if anybody wants to donate anything along those lines, um, get in touch. You know, it, it, We're going to do this probably early December, I would guess, right? Something like that. We haven't set a date. Yes. Yeah. yeah or maybe even end of November to accommodate schedules. We'll just see how, how it works out. But, uh, but yes, and, and some of the items just look really fun. You know, stockings that are hanging upside down, the candy canes that are upside down. And um, it's, uh, it's always a, a fun event just to stand back afterwards. And then anyone that after it's, it's uh, it's all decorated. If you're heading north, just turn at the Mono Cone and go by and you know swing through Matley because it we've got it lit up at night and it looks at it's uh, it's it's really fun. Okay, and and one more thing, Robin, if I may. Yes. This is yes. Me. Um, the uh, the other thing is that I'm always asked to help coordinate, or I have been in the past, the the Ghost of the Sagebrush Tour event, which is in August. 
is it too early to think about August? No, it isn't. Um, and um, I remember sitting exhausted on the porch of the museum at, at the end of last August's Ghost of the Sagebrush Day. And somebody said, well, how about if we do this? And I said, no, no, I don't want to think about it right now. I'm too <laughs> tired. But it's time to start contemplating. And we'll talk about this with the trustees. But again, any of you, any, any of you are interested in what we do, um, if you have a suggestion for a theme, um, uh, a topic that we you, you would like to see us do, we can repeat some. We've been doing these now for 18 years, I think it is. Um, and, um, you know, but but uh, that's another thing to get a, get a hold of, of us and, uh, is, and share your thoughts. All right. Does anybody else have any questions, comments? All righty. Well, um, let's see here. Uh, I did want to say that before our presentation starts, we are going to ask Jeff Gabriel, one of our um, presenters, who is the executive director of ECF, to please talk to us a little bit about the history conference. So maybe, Jeff, if you wouldn't mind uh, doing that now, and then we'll go ahead and talk about the presentation. Does that sound okay? Sounds great. All right. Yeah, well, thank you, Robin, for the opportunity and for the, making the uh, suggestion. So we have at the end of October there, 29th and 30th and 31st of this, or, I'm sorry, 28th, 29th, and 30th, uh, we had the um, 7th Annual Eastern Sierra History Conference, and uh, we had uh, um, Robert Marks uh, presenting, and Janet and uh, Dave Carl were there as well. And so we did, back out of COVID for two years, we were virtual, so we came back um, in person. We did a new venue this year. Uh, we returned back to Bishop, uh, which was the original uh, location back in 2016 that we ended up going to Saracosa Community College there in Bishop and it certainly was exceeding our expectations of, um, of a venue. So I think for next year, we're gonna do the same. So we would encourage everybody that next year, the end of October, which will be October 27th and 28th and 29th, 2023, we'll have the eighth annual Eastern Sierra History Conference. So thank you for the opportunity to, to share that. Okay, hey, thank you. So uh, tonight's presentation is Born Free and Equal, the story of loyal Japanese and Americans. And our presenters are Jeff Gabriel and Bernadette Johnson. And Jeff is the, as I just said a little while ago, the executive director of the Eastern Sierra Interpretive Association. And Jeff came to the Eastern Sierra in 2016 from Topeka, Kansas, where he was born and raised he attended Kansas State University and holds degrees in wildlife biology, political science, and public administration. Uh, Jeff is a certified interpretive guide and certified interpretive guide host trainer through the National Association of Interpretation. Jeff and his wife Jane live in Bishop and they have four children. And a few of the organizations that uh, Jeff is involved with is uh, he's a member of the Eastern Sierra Audubon Society, uh, Boy Scouts of America adult leader, uh, president of the Yosemite Gateway Partners, uh, treasurer of the Alabama Hills Stewardship Group. He's a master gardener and involved with the Sunrise Rotary Club of Bishop, to name a few. So you're a busy man. <laughs> And Bernadette has lived in the Eastern Sierra to, since 2009 and has had a 31 year federal career with the National Park Service and Bureau of Land Management that included working in the amazing places like the uh, National Park Service Southwest Regional Office in Santa Fe, Grand Canyon National Park, Glacier National Park, uh, and Lake Havasu and Carson City. She retired as the superintendent of Manzanar a year ago after seven and a half years at the park. You've lived in some really amazing places. 
Uh, Bernadette considers working on the reprinting of Born Free and Equal one of the most important accomplishments in her career. She has had a lifelong interest in land and resources management, history, and social justice. She originally came to the East Side as the Bishop issues in Mono County. In retirement, she enjoys dabbling in genealogy, gardening, and is an active Rotarian. Bernadette and her husband, Dale, live in Bishop with their canine son, Rudy. And I think we're ready to start the presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Jeff. Thank right, you, right. Jeff. Okay, give me a few moments here. I'm gonna... um... All right. Okay. So everybody be Okay, I'm gonna kick off. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, first, I wanna say thank you for having Jeff and uh, myself on this evening. And um, the this is my background, but it's also the cover of our presentation. So first, I'd like to just acknowledge that Mandanar um, is on the homelands of our indigenous neighbors um, in Pio Unaru. And um, I consider Manzanar one of the places where we can really witness and sense the forced removal of people. That first forced removal was with our Paiute neighbors when they were forcibly removed from the Owens Valley in uh, the late 1800s, um, only to be for, for the white settlers and miners to use the land and then the removal of folks um, it, from that era uh, to be removed um, and lose their livelihood in the orchard and agricultural communities established at the town site of Manzanar um, in the 19 teens and 20s. Um, so when the town of Manzanar was considered abandoned by the county, um, in 1942, when the federal government was looking for a place to forcibly remove folks um, from the West Coast, Manzanar again found itself as one of those places where forcing took place. Um, so this is one of my favorite um, views of Manzanar. I took it um, several years before I retired. Um, but I keep it as my background, just as a reminder of how important um, this story is, not only uh, based on the incarceration of Japanese immigrants and Japanese Americans, but really about the injustices that happen when we don't really consider one another um, in light of um, the rights that we all um, have inherently as humans and as Americans. Um, so Jeff, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Um, so Manzanar started out in 1942 as um, the Owens Valley um, Relocation Center. Um, it was first administered by um, the military um, and folks first arrived in April um, April 1st, 1942, so not very long after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Um, and um, where Ansel Adams sort of intersects um, happens when his friend Ralph Merritt is assigned as the project director of the War Relocation Center at Manzanar in November of 1942. Ansel and Ralph had met each other through the Sarah Club in Yosemite. Uh, Ralph had lived um, on the west side and was uh, one of the executives at um, Sunmade Raisin um, Company. 
and he became very interested in Yosemite and the East Side. Um, when things failed with his job at the uh, raisins growers, um, he came over to the East Side. He had friends and family in the Independence area and um, a lot of history there about how he ended up at Manzanar. It includes, for those of you that know much about Inyo Associates, it includes his friend um, that uh, started uh, Inyo Associates with Father Crowley and was the um, assistant director at Manzanar. Um, but um, in the fall of 1943, Ralph Merritt invites Ansel Adam to photograph daily life at Manzanar. Um, there were other photo, uh, photo opportunities that happened by many famous people, um, including Dorothea Lang. They were, uh, Dorothea was paid by the federal government to document um, the relocation of Japanese Americans. Um, and the difference is that Ansel was not paid by the federal government. In fact, he, um, volunteered to do that at the request of Ralph. And we'll hear more about that um, in an interview that Manzanar conducted with his son, Michael, uh, later on in the presentation. Um, I think in Ansel's own words, he considered um, this project one of the most important social projects of his life. Um, he uh, published the essay and these photographs um, with the assistance of U.S. Camera uh, Book Company in 1944. Um, it, was, it was very different than the landscapes we all know and love Ansel for. Um, and um, we'll see in a couple of the next slides how he really tried to portray the people who were incarcerated. So Jeff, why don't you go to the next slide now? Um, this is sort of where it started. I know this is a little bit hard to read, but in December of 1943, after Ralph had invited Ansel um, to um, come and uh, photograph, Ansel provided this uh, first draft of what he thought born free and equal uh, might look like. And during the reprinting process with ESIA, one of the National Park Service Rangers, Dr. Patricia Biggs, uh, found this original text. It was something that we weren't aware of, uh, but in researching for this reprinting, she was able to find it. So you're looking at Ansel's first proposal to Ralph Merritt. There, there's um, that it has the text, um, the things that I love in this second page, um, I'll just read it. The people in this book are, as you will see, looking you directly in the, the eye. Can you return their gaze with a clear conscience? So I think Axel knew exactly what he was doing and what he wanted this book to be. Um, so next slide. So here's, here's a family, another famous photographer in the Japanese American community. Uh, the gentleman um, on our left is Toyo Miyatake, and these are um, her, his kids that we see. And the young man at the right-hand corner is uh, Bobby Miyatake. And when the National Park Service did his oral history, this is what he said about this photograph that Ansel took. Um, Ansel was probably thinking he doesn't want to show a bunch of ragtag kind of people in this. He wants to show that they're human being. If he's going to call it born free and equal, then he wants to make them look equal. So what powerful words from Bobby um, as he looked back at being the subject of this photograph. Um, it's my understanding that Toyo, Bobby's father, and Ansel remained friends uh, for their lifetimes. 
and that Ansel often visited the family after they moved back to the San Gabriel Valley. Uh, the Miyatake family still has a studio there. It's still called the Toyo Miyatake Studio. And they hold uh, many uh, uh, original photographs from Manzanar as well. So I, I think that this particular um, image that Ansel took um, is an important connection between the past um, and the, the present. Next slide. Um, you know, what do we think about uh, other people? Um, so this young lady, her name is Joyce Okazaki. And at um, what is now called Merritt Park, where you see this um, gazebo, her mother and her sister uh, were um, folks that Ansel photographed. Um, there, there are other um, compilations of Ansel's images, which um, are part of the public domain. He donated them to the Library of Congress. So in the early 2000s, another version was printed. Um, and the image of this young girl, Joyce, um, is the cover of, of that version. Um, and every time I met with Joyce or was at a public event with Joyce, um, she always had her copy of Born for an Equal. So Born for an Equal was a special publication, I think, for those people who were incarcerated. Um, and as you read what she says, um, she considers it a fortunate experience then and later. Um, and for her, it made incarceration a little more pleasant um, in her memory. Um, and I think that she really valued that her family was photographed by Ansel um, because of his notoriety. Um, and um, I think that's just really, um, for me, uh, was one of the things that I was impressed with, uh, that people, you know, 75 and 80 years later still valued that original work um, of Ansel's. Uh, next slide, Jeff. Um, so, you know, we read this before, and I'll just ask you, um, you know, as we look at, you know, our nation's current um, environment. Um, that next sentence that Ansel wrote is, is, is the Constitution and the Bill of Rights pleasant gibberish for you? Or do you accept and support the sublime principles in your mind and heart and in contact with your fellows? So I, I challenge everybody to, to think about that and how we protect our basic human rights. Uh, next slide, Jeff. Um, I think that, you know, this also is um, from um, the proposal. Um, and I think that um, there are many things that Ansel, you know, was thinking when he thought about the rights and privileges afforded to Japanese Americans and Japanese immigrants. I don't think that it was um, random. He and his family had um, Japanese immigrants and Japanese Americans that um, worked for them and they were familiar with. Um, so I think it was really personal for Ansel. And I think that um, for him and Ralph Merritt, they were really trying um, to ensure that they were on the right side of history. Um, so Jeff, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, but what did it really do to Ansel's reputation, right? His photographs are amazing, and you'll see that in the book. Um, hopefully, you all have a copy of the, the book. Um, but um, he was promised some things, right? He, he was known in the art community. 
and his, um, you know, friends, uh, the New Halls, um, who were who curated a photography exhibit for him at the Modern Art Museum in New York City. Um, I, I think he thought that the, that because of his notoriety and his reputation, he would be able to really advance this body of work uh, for its social justice component. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think that happened. Um, many of the books never really made it into circulation. In his own words, in some of his oral history interviews, um, Ansel comments that you know, this exhibit was really relegated down to the basement. And so it never really became what he had hoped it to become. A sister exhibit was held um, or curated for Manzanar. And Manzanar's first museum really was uh, during the incarceration period of the 40s. Um, and um, it had thousands of visitors. Um, so we have to remember that, you know, over 11,000 people were incarcerated at Manzanar. And when Ansel's work was uh, curated um, at Manzanar, it probably had more visitors than what the Modern Art Museum had. Um, and um, this is, this ex excerpt was just from the newspaper at Manzanar, the Manzanar Free Press. But I think that Ansel probably, Ansel's career may have suffered somewhat because he delved into this topic at the time and it wasn't very popular. Next slide. Um, so uh, we at National, the National Park Service interviewed um, Michael Adams. Um, and one of the reasons we did that was um, when I arrived at Manzanar in 2014, I asked staff what were some of the things that were important to them and reprinting Born Free and Equal and getting it back out into the hands of the public was one of those things. And um, through, you know, some folks I was familiar with who were familiar with Michael's daughter, um, I got in contact with Michael and Sarah um, and Jeannie Adams um, to talk to them about what they thought about the National Park Service partnering with the Ansel Adams Trust um, to reprint this body of work and bring it back um, to the public. The, the images and the text are already in the Library of Congress. But honestly, how many of you guys go to the Library of Congress on a daily basis? Even though I'm a, you know, had been a lifelong bureaucrat, even I don't go to the Library of Congress very often. So making the book available and making it easy for visitors to Manzanar and to the East Side to have this book again was important. Um, so we began some conversations with Michael and his family. Um, and this is another highlight of my career. I was actually uh, part of this interview and Jeff and I just want you to hear from Ansel's son, um, who also came to Manzanar with Ansel as a child. So some context, Ansel came to Manzanar four times and photographed. Uh, many people in their daily life. And so let's go ahead and play this clip from Michael's interview. How influenced do you think your father was in his feelings about the incarceration based upon people like Harry um, and the Obata uh, family the Obata that family. he knew before, long before the war? I think he war. was very disappointed. And I think he was, you know, that this happened and that it was not right. I don't know. You know, it took uh, Ralph Merritt to get him over here, mm -hmm. and he wanted to do this as sort of a documentary, but he didn't want to be paid for it. It was he was going to do it on his own, and so he never accepted any money for coming over here on those four trips. I think he was disappointed in what had happened. Uh, it happened, 
and you live with what happened. And he wanted, I think, to make sure that what he was going to do was sort of show how these people, un unfairly as it was, they functioned, they tolerated it, they survived, they lived with this thing that they had to. They were forced into this, and I, I think that he was very sympathetic to what. Yeah. Well, you can read his writing in Born Free and Equal, and I think he's, yeah. you know, he was yeah. quite insistent, of, you know, on that. Tell me about the process, from, from your perspective, what you remember, that process of your dad trying to create the book Born Free and Equal. Well, he worked with the U.S. camera people on that, and I, I saw the photographs as they come up, and I don't remember the text at the time. I remember when the book came out, I remember his disappointment in the, ex well, there was an exhibit here. I think the people locally, the, the people who were incarcerated here thought it was great. But the exhibit was also in New York, and it was put in the basement of the Museum of Modern Art. It didn't last very long. A lot of books disappeared. You know, this is 44, and there was still a lot of animosity. And um, so, in a way, it wasn't a very successful story from the, from the demonstration, you know, from the book and from the exhibit. Although it got out, he was disappointed, I think, in the quality of the U.S. camera production. And that was probably one of his biggest disappointments. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think he was very proud of the fact that he did it. And I'd love to see another uh, effort to do it. My my hope for that is if you do, and I hope you can, you're successful, is to do it with the quality that Ansel would appreciate. And that means probably a more expensive production than the, essentially the paperback that uh, the U.S. camera did. As I know Ansel was disappointed in the quality, and that was that's important. So we'll do what we can to help you on that. That's wonderful. What do you think the legacy of Born Free and Equal is? I think it's wonderful. What a wonderful name for the story that it was telling. And I think it, had a, it has a great story. And I uh, would like to see it continue. And like I said, we'd, we'll help you in any way we can to, uh, to do that. Do you, have a memory, do you have a memory of your father coming up with that name or how, no. how it came No, to except it was pretty obvious they were born free and equal as American citizens, and this shouldn't have happened. So I hope everybody can hear. Um, so um, this part is kind of following up on Michael talking about republishing the book. So as uh, Bernadette shared in 1944, Ansel published it through the U.S. Camera Book Publishing Company. And as you can see in this, this slide, um, to the left there is a um, copy of the original book um, that had a book cover. Um, it was um, a green with a sort of a burnt color covering. Um, and again, when we republished this book and uh, went to the Ansel Adams Publishing Rights Trust, which owns Ansel Adams' name, um, their initial part was, you have to republish this book as it was published in 1944, using the same font, using the same color. And so um, the company that we used to publish this um, did an extensive amount of research and tried to duplicate as best they could the color and the fonts um, that were used in the book. Um, the picture on the right is a copy of the, uh, the book itself um, as it was published in 1944. And one of the agreements that we had with the Ansel Adams Publishing Rights Trust in, and again, kind of highlighting Michael's part about having the quality photos that were taken back in 1944 by Ansel is to enhance them. And so we had the opportunity through the Ansel Adams Publishing Rights Trust to hire a gentleman by the name of Alan Ross. 
And Alan Ross was one of the last apprentice of Ansel Adams and had been considered one of where Ansel wanted him to do a number of his prints at, the, at Ansel's passing. And, and so Alan Ross and his uh, wife um, do the prints for the Ansel Adams Gallery. And so we had Alan help us on this book. And so all photos that are in the book, except for six of them, as Bernadette indicated, are in the Library of Congress. There are five photos that were um, not a part of the uh, Library of Congress, but because of Alan Ross's ability and his statue within the Ansel Adams family and with the trust, we were able to get those five photos. The one photo that we were not able to retrieve in the book, it's a picture of a Japanese unit, a Japanese American unit fighting in World War II crossing a stream. And that photo was actually taken, uh, taken by the uh, War Department. And when we uh, reached out the US Department of Defense, um, they had no idea where that print was or if it ever even existed um, currently. Um, obviously it existed at the time in 1944, but it uh, didn't seem to be in the archives. Um, so it was great to be able to have um, Alan Ross do this. And, and I think the unique thing for us as we went through this process that um, when um, we were doing the pictures, um, you know, it would talk about, um, Alan Ross would talk about, you know, well, I, I think this is what Ansel would want. This is, I think, how he would see it, how he'd want to do this. And, and so it was really fascinating to listen to Alan as he talked about how Ansel might have done this photo or changed this photo or enhanced the photo um, in the sense of what it was trying to um, share with his audience. So it was a really neat experience to, uh, to have that insight. Again, um, this is sort of a layout of all the photos that are in the book. Um, and again, all but six of them are in the Library of Congress. And Alan was able to download the original print negatives and then from there enhance those. Um, again, five of the photos I mentioned, um, he had the ability of getting access to and, and having the negatives for those. Um, again, the only other one that we could not find um, he did take a photo of it and then enhanced that photo um, for the publication of the different photos that were in uh, the book. And just one of Ansel Adams' quotes from the social point of view, that's the most important thing I've done or can do. And I think that was both shared by Bernadette and by his son, Michael, about he really felt that this was one of the most important parts um, that he could have done in his career as a photographer in capturing these images uh, that were at uh, Manzanar. And again, um, you know, Ansel was not one to do portraits. He was more of the landscape. And so for him, this was something um, that was normally out of his uh, realm, but he felt it was extremely important. So you will see there, um, that is um, the cover. Um, so it is very close to what the original 1944 publication looked like. Um, again, um, try to get the font as close as possible, the color as close as possible. And so in reprinting the book, as I mentioned, we had to get the approval of the Ansel Adams Publishing Rights Trust um, because they own the name Ansel Adams. And you can't uh, publish anything with Ansel's name, uh, particularly on the outside cover, uh, without their approval. Um, and, and for both Bernadette and myself, we worked tirelessly to get in contact with one of the trustees of the trust, and we were successful in doing that. Um, as we went through the discussion of this, again, their part was you can reprint this in its entirety as it was printed in 1944. But as I think as more discussion went on and they were, you know, wanting the photos to be enhanced and they um, endorsed using Alan Ross as the person who would do that, um, they came back, which was really um, um, 
enjoyable to hear their willingness to entertain was they allowed for us to add eight pages to the original book. Um, and that gave us the opportunity to at least give a perspective historically about what the discussion was going on between Ansel Adams and Ralph Merritt and some of the thoughts that Ansel had as he made notations in his own personal journal um, that are now available uh, for people to read. So I think it was great to be able to help explain that. And, and from the trustees of the Ansel Adams Publishing Rights Trust, they felt that was important. Um, you know, there was a deep discussion about can we change some of the misspelling or grammatical errors that originally were in the document? Um, some things we were able to change and some things we had to leave it as it was. So it was a great opportunity for us to have um, a list of partners and um, want to go through some of those partners that, that we had. Um, so um, as Eastern Sierra Interpretive Association, we are the official nonprofit partner of the Manzanar National Historic Site. Um, we um, got that distinction and honor in 2018. Um, and then City of Files Press, um, Rich Calhoun and Michael Williams, they own City Files Press. Um, it's a small publishing company in Chicago. They were very gracious in helping us reprint it. Uh, Bernadette and I went to a number of different other publishers. And um, the one highlight for the City's File Press, for other the publishers that we went to, you know, when we told them the error limitation is, we have to print the book as it originally um, was printed in 1944, we are permitted to add the eight pages. Um, many other publishers were like, okay, well, where are you gonna sell the book? Well, at the time, and it still is, from the Ansel um, Adams Publishing Rights Trust, it was, ECA, you can only sell the book. It cannot be sold in Barnes and Noble. It can't be sold uh, any other small bookstores or any other book um, retail locations in the country. Only ECA, your locations, and through your on website. Most of the publishers were like, well, that, that's unacceptable. You have to go back and tell them that it needs to be sold different locations and just not with ECM. Um, and Bernadette and I realized that that would not be something probably the Ansel Adams Trust would be receptive to. The great thing about Rich and Michael, they were like, we don't need that. We think that this is so important, it needs to be republished, and we're willing to just accept the terms as it is right now with the Ansel Adams Publishing Rights Trust. So, and then I wanna highlight um, the person that we work with closely with is Claudia Rice. She's one of the trustees of the Ansel Adams Publishing Rights Trust. And then I talked about Alan and Julie Ross um, with Alan Ross Photography, and then Bernadette and Patricia both with Manzanar. So the group of the individuals that are on this slide, we met um, every other week um, and talked about, you know, uh, the photos, talked about the fonts, talked about the color, talked about everything in getting this publication republished um, to meet the requirements of the Ansel Adams Publishing Rights Trust, and at the same time, making the Adams family proud and hoping to make Ansel Adams what he was wanting it to be like when he published it in 1944. And then I want to highlight a couple others. Um, again, Michael and Jeannie Adams, um, they were very supportive and very helpful. Um, and then the Center for Creative Photography, um, the uh, Rebecca, Alexis, and Leah were very helpful um, in providing those five additional photos that were not in the Library of Congress. And again, what makes this even more special is, is that as we were publishing this, we were going through COVID. So at the Center for Creative Photography, no one was working. There was nobody in uh, the center, um, but Rebecca and Alexis and Leo were very gracious in getting permission from security at the University of Arizona to get into the center, uh, get the negatives that Alan Ross needed and uh, getting those um, transmitted to him so he could be able to do the other photos. And then uh, highlight David B. Um, with the law firm in Chicago. 
um, with regard to the copyright requirements and the needs of making sure that we met all that uh, before continuing on with the publishing of the book. And then as um, the one photo that Bernadette had in the slide that we were showing, um, this is um, the, uh, the merit part. And then we are very grateful for the fund for people in parks um, with regard to the financial support. Um, they provided ECIA with a grant um, to help support um, the republication of this book. And without their support, it would not have happened. So we'd like to highlight the fund for the people in the parks and their contribution financially to help get this book uh, reprinted and uh, distributed around the country and around the world, really. We've had a number of people who have purchased it um, that are from Japan. And then um, here's um, down at the far left um, is the original book cover as it was published in 1944. And then at the right um, is um, the book that we published here um, just a couple of years ago. So very close, very close. And then a highlight um, behind it is uh, uh, Karina Oranami. Uh, and if you purchase the book, Born Free and Equal, um, you get um, this um, crane or an army um, that's shown in the background. And, and um, Bernadette can be able to share a little bit more, but George Ord, um, who was incarcerated at Manzanar, and I don't know, I think he's 93, 94. Um, and uh, he's been making these cranes during COVID and his family graciously donated them to ECIA. So <clears throat> when you buy a book, um, you get a crane and then you get a little postcard uh, highlighting um, a little bit more information about George. And I, I don't know, Bernadette, you may be able to add more than, than I can. And I think this is our last slide. Yeah, I th um, yeah. the special part of the folded origami is that George Oda and his family were incarcerated at Manzanar. And probably for the last at least dozen years, his family has been coordinating a Manzanar reunion uh, that happens once a year, uh, but um, COVID was hard on all of us, right? Jeff and I and the other team members, we had the benefit of focusing on this most important reprinting of our limited 3,000 copies is what the trust said ECIA could publish. Uh, but for George, one of the things um, he did um, to deal with the isolation that he faced during COVID was to make these paper cranes and then generously wanted to give back to the site and considered it quite an honor. Um, I think Jeff had tons of these in multiple boxes. Um, so we're really pleased that those were afforded to us and that um, when you buy a book, you get one of those personally folded cranes by this really special man. All right, are there any questions? I know there are some questions in the in the chat. I don't know how you guys want to. Robin, are you going to moderate those questions? <laughs> Hey, let's see. Yes, I am. I'm just uh, getting to the point where I can get there. So yes, we do have some questions in the chat. And then if anyone, uh, rather than typing into the chat, if you want to just raise your hand uh, in the, the uh, Zoom application, we can uh, unmute you as well. Um, let's see here. Okay. Okay, so the, um, the first question we have is from Rich, and he says, how about the other camps? He thinks that some are getting some restoration or at least some recognition. Can you tell us anything about that? Sure. Um, several of them are um, additional units to the National Park System. So Manzanar was established as a National Park Unit in um, 1992, uh, but since then, um, others that have joined the National Park System are uh, Tule Lake in Northern California, Minidoka 
um, in Idaho, just about 45 minutes outside of Twin Falls. Um, Hanauli Uli in um, Hawaii. And um, most recently, um, uh, the site in Colorado, which is known as Amachi or Granada. Um, so those are all administered by the National Park Service. Um, there are other, um, there were 10 camps total and um, others are privately um, operated. One is Heart Mountain near Cody, Wyoming. Um, the other is um, the Poston site near Parker, Arizona, just over the California border. Um, and it is on uh, tribal lands of the Colorado River Indian tribe. Um, the Gila River uh, camp um, is on the Gila River um, tribal community as well. It's not as restored. And then finally, um, there's a site in Arkansas, um, Rower and Jerome. And the, uh, well, there's two private ones. So Rower and Jerome in Arkansas are managed by a small board of local community members. And then the second one that is managed by um, community members is Topaz in Utah. And they've got a really nice museum in Delta, Utah. Um, so there's lots of ongoing efforts um, to restore or um, tell the stories at each of those 10 camps. That's good news to hear. Um, Pat Rutowski is asking, when was the reprint published and how do we buy the book? And uh, Jeff did put in the chat the um, ECIA's website so that, uh, that people can go on. Now, Jeff, I was on the website earlier today and I thought, oh my God, because I saw that it said limited quantity. You, do you still have books? We do, we still have, um, we still have books. And uh, so I think um, the part that we wanna do is at least our initial run was only 3000 copies. So I think we're just over probably 1500 copies left. So um, we do have copies that are available, so yes. Okay, and then when was the reprint published or written by, by ECF? I think it was 2021, is that right, Bernadette? I'm trying to think, yeah, 2021. It, uh, <laughs> this was quite a long process. <laughs> I know it was 2021 because I kept egging Jeff, like, I am gonna <laughs> retire in November and nobody knows this, so when is the book gonna be published? <laughs> Well, it's, um, it's really an amazing effort that you folks have gone through uh, and, and how blessed are we and the generations beyond us to, uh, to still be able to see this book and then to see it in such an enhanced version. Uh, Rich, is there any folks with their hands up? Oh, it looks like Bob Marks has his hand up, but I don't know how to, how to get to him. Uh, I just unmuted myself. I don't know if I oh. can. <laughs> there you go. If I can video myself. Uh, <laughs> oh, it says unable start uh, video. Um, but uh, Jeff and Bernadette, uh, I echo uh, Robin's uh, comments about uh, how important this is to uh, pull together and do as uh, uh, accurate a uh, reproduction of an important historical document as, uh, as we can find. Um, and uh, I look forward to, uh, to getting a copy and seeing it. Um, I assume one of the things, one of the questions, I've got two or three questions. So I, I assume one of the uh, things that differentiates uh, this production from the uh, 2002 version, also called Born Free and Equal, that was sold by the uh, Eastern Sierra Museum some time ago, um, is the, uh, the, uh, the, the photographs themselves, the quality of the production, um, and any number of other things. So that's one thing. I mean, what differentiates this from the, if I had my camera up, I'd be able to, I, I think you know which one I'm, I mean. 
Um, <clears throat> um, then uh, the uh, the other question that I have, and I think this is implicit, is uh, this should be widely uh, available, and I think it will be, and it should be uh, widely sold. But uh, where do the proceeds go? Do those go to ESIA um, or not? Um, and I hope it does. <laughs> and then the third question is, um, when we look at, and, and if this is a, a recreation of a historical document, um, we can interrogate historical documents from any number of, of uh, directions. And clearly the, uh, the first point is from uh, looking at the incarceration of uh, Japanese Americans during World War uh, II in the United States. Um, but there's been a recent book that also looks at the, uh, the camps from the point of view of environmental history. Um, and that is, uh, what did these camps do? This was uh, uh, Connie Chang, the Nature Behind Barbed Wire and Environmental History of Japanese Americans um, Incarceration. Um, and so uh, what can we uh, learn from this document that goes beyond um, the, uh, the photographs and the Ansel Adams story to, uh, to looking at some broader questions about uh, changes to the environment over the past uh, 50 to 60 years? Uh, I've got other questions, but those are three to throw out. Well, I, I will uh, answer with regards to the, um, the expense or at least the proceeds. So um, the initial cost of printing the books and having Alan enhance the photos was about $75,000. Um, the grants from Fund the People in the Parks was just over $35,000. Um, so the balance of that was out of ECS um, funding that we normally have set aside for Manzanar. Um, but the hope was that through the selling of the books and then the proceeds of that will then help generate uh, a pool of resources that we'll be able to do another run. So the hope is that after we sell the 3,000 copies, we'd be able to go back to the Ansel Adams Publishing Rights Trust and ask if we could reprint again, um, either 3,000 copies or, or, or more. Um, and then to see maybe about opening it up where we can be able to get it more distributed um, in, in, in more areas than just through ECF. But um, that's at least the part on the funding in it. And I didn't even think about this and, and uh, as Bernadette and I were thinking about putting this together, but we were certainly honored um, to be awarded the publication of the year by the Public Lands Alliance, which is an organization that represents um, groups like ECIA, uh, Yosemite Conservancy, Zon Forever, Great Smoky Mountain Association, Eastern National, Western National, um, all organizations very similar to ECIA all over North America. And we were awarded the publication of the year um, last um, March uh, or this March of 2022. So that was a very distinct honor uh, for those in the interpretive education realm of the National Park, Forest Service, Army Corps of Engineers, Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to be um, awarded the publication of the year. So uh, Bernadette, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll just kind of piggy off, piggyback off of Jeff. I think one of the things to uh, point out, uh, Jeff mentioned that um, ECA became Mandanar's nonprofit partner um, in 2018. So when I um, look at what ECIA has been able to accomplish in such a short time, um, I, I think that um, it's pretty incredible that a small organization based on the east side was able to pull this off. Um, and you know, Jeff and I started working on this like on day one. Um, and I had been working with others since 2015 on trying to get an appetite from others to reprint this book. So uh, big kudos to Isia. Um, when I retired in November of 2021, Isia was um, Manzanar's only philanthropic partner at that point. So the proceeds um, from this book and the sales of the bookstore 
um, at the visitor center all go directly back to support Manzanar and through its interpretive efforts and, and many other projects. Uh, Jeff and his leadership um, have really um, stepped up at Manzanar and I'm sure you'll see new things that they're still working on to come in the days ahead. Um, I think, um, Bob, your question about, you know, how this book fits in in different contexts and what makes it special. For me, it really is about um, the um, ability for an organization like the National Park Service to be affiliated with um, the body of work that Ansel felt was so significant to our nation's history that he donated it to the Library of Congress and that it doesn't just sit stale in some vault with his original negatives, um, but that you know, now we have a digital version of those that, that any of you can go download. Um, but I'm still an old dog, right? And I want to dog ear my book. Um, and, and I've got, you know, the, uh, I, I wish I had an original 1944, but I don't, but I've got a facsimile that I bought off of Amazon. I've got the two, early 2000s version and I've got this book. And for me, I hope that many of you will appreciate the ability um, to look at this body of work and realize how um, many of the same social issues that existed pre-World War II um, exist today. And obviously I'm not Japanese American, um, but I can definitely see myself in some of the same issues that we sadly have to continue to face. So until as a society, we can really treat each other with the dignity and respect that we all deserve, regardless of our race, regardless of our you know, economic situations, our education. The essay that Ansel wrote still applies. Can you look at me in the eyes while we turn away immigrants at our southern border? Can you, you know, look at um, our indigenous neighbors without looking at their forced removal and the trauma and the generational trauma that we've created? Can you look at our Japanese American descendants of people incarcerated and not feel the generational trauma that exists within that community. Um, so for me, that's what set this, sets this apart um, because I, I believe with my whole being that racism exists, it existed before World War II, because incarceration just did not begin the day after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. But when we look back at history and we saw segregation of schools, we saw um, the Golden Sons of the West um, treating Japanese Americans and other Asians terribly, um, all of those things, um, that hasn't changed. And if someone reads this book and Ansel's uh, essay and changes their heart, then we'll have done a good job. And, and that's why it's one of the, the projects I'm really proud of. It's not the only one, but it's, it's, it was really special to be able to work on it. And Bob, I'm not familiar with the, um, the book that you mentioned about um, the environment and Japanese American incarceration, but if you'll put that link in the chat, I'd like to take a look at it. So I can't speak to that.
Thank you. Those were really special words that you just shared with us all. Um, Jeff, uh, Dave put in here in the chat about actually going to one of the ECA visitor centers and bookstores to pick up the book. And you said uh, in the chat that yes, they are available at the bookstores. Would you be, would you mind just uh, giving us where each of the bookstores are? Sure. Um, the ones that are open now through the winter season um, is the Mammoth Lakes Visitor Center. And um, the other location would be in Lone Pine at the Interagency Visitor Center. Um, as everyone will know, the Mona Basin Visitor Center is closed for the season. Um, and for this winter, uh, White Mountain Ranger Station will not be open. So really the other two would be Mammoth Lakes and, and Lone Pine. And then if, if you would want, I certainly would offer that if you can, I can put my email in uh, the chat and you could send me an email and uh, we can, uh, we have copies sitting in the Bishop office and the home office there at White Mountain Ranger Station. So, you know, if, if you were coming through Bishop and wanted to pick one up, uh, we can certainly be able to do that. Okay, thank you. And thank you for such a wonderful presentation. This has been great. Um, let's see, I think, let's see, just a second. Um, let's see, I don't seem like I have my mouse working very well or something here, let's see. And uh, Barry McPherson says, thank you so much for getting this book reprinted and for the presentation tonight. He bought two copies of the book already and gave two away. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Bob Marks, uh, thank you so much, Bernadette and Jeff. This was special. Here's the citation, and he put that into the chat. So hopefully you can get the, that off. Do you see that, Bernadette? Okay, okay. So do we have any other questions or hands raised? Um, I'm not seeing any more. Rich, if you're seeing something that I'm not, can you nope, let me I, know? I, I think we're at the end. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again. This was wonderful. And uh, we, uh, we hope everyone gets this book. And it seems like it's really important and one maybe to save for our children to see as well. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. And then folks online, um, we'll have things out on, the, um, on our Facebook and emails as far as December goes. And thanks, everyone, for joining this evening. And have a good night. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Good night.